Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. We are in our series on Louis Sullivan's system of architectural ornament. We've come right to the middle here and in right stab in the middle of this book, there is this one page interlude on the doctrine of parallelism. So let's, let's we're going to have uh, Rob Trasinski read it and we'll go from there. Rob. All right. Interlude, the doctrine of parallelism. We have now progressed to a point where it seems necessary and opportune to make a brief review of progress. The prelude to the series of plates sets forth in literary form man's natural powers as the foundation of his deeds. Then begins, as illustrated in the plates, the development of a technical thesis with the objective in view of exposing these powers in action as applied to a specific form of activity called architectural ornament. The outworking of the thesis is a science and an art. Uh, sorry, the outworking of the thesis as a science and an art is of necessity technical, inasmuch as it involves a new conception of energy and a new philosophic and practical deductions therefrom. The theme is therefore exploited analytically and synthetically, differentially and integrally, with the object ever in view of so humanizing science that it energizes art, and so exhibiting the masterful fluency of art that it in turn illuminates science. Between science and art, there appears at first view a sense of separated parallel activities. Such mental picture of them softens as the Euclidean sense of parallel gradually enters a seemingly nebulous domain, which we here call parallelism. If it were better and true, it were better and truer to call this domain mystic, for within it art, science, and philosophy fuse, as it were, into a single vital impulse. In this same sense, the inorganic and the organic, seemingly utterly apart, are caused to enter the same domain of parallelism and fuse or blend into an integral phenomenon, this time by the powers of man's imaginative will. It may be here injected that imagination is the greatest of man's single working powers, and the trickiest, as the intellect is the frailest, the most subject to derangement, the most given to cowardice and betrayal, unless it be held steady and sane by the power of instinct. Oops. Um, well, I'm having a little trouble here because I can't get to the bottom of this page somehow. I think it's... Here, read it here. Yeah, I will read it here. The power of intellect is valid beyond a doubt, but folly comes when it is allowed to usurp dominion over instinct. The chief exhibit of intellect is called logic, but the processes of instinct involve a logic infinitely more subtle, much more powerful, because primordial. It is to this diaphanous, labile logic of instinct, ever operative and perceptible as processes involving certitude and finality, that the free spirit of man inclines through sympathy with life. For life is of this transcendental logic and exhibits it, first to the instinct and slowly thereafter to the intellect of man. Such considerations open to view a still larger domain of parallelism namely the parallelism between man and nature and between man and his works. These are self-contained within the all-embracing domain of life, the universal power or energy which flows everywhere at all times, in all places, seeking expression and form and thus parallel to all things. Man stands by virtue of his powers, a solitary ego within a universe of energy, a witness, a participant, and by virtue of his powers, a co-creator. His creations are but parallels of himself. It has been deemed urgent to devise this literary interlude because to evidence its varied suggestions apart by graphical illustrations would require space far beyond the limits of this work. However interesting it might be to the advanced student to observe the scientifico-poetic theory, or rather conviction, gradually unfold itself to the physical eye. It is to the inner eye, therefore, that a very considerable part of the appeal must perforce be made. Therefore, what this work may lack in scientific continuity of gradual illustration must be compensated by continuity and sensibility and thought by the student. Such process may proceed either way as a sentient development on an intellectual background, 
or as an intellectual development on a sentient background. The illustrations may be traced back to their primitive origins, or the primitive origins may be followed in their expanding development. Technically, plate 7 is a simple study in two vertical parallel axes. Plate 8 is a further study in a multiple parallel axes, both vertical and horizontal, with the introduction of distant parallels and fluent parallels, thus preparing for the larger idea of parallelism. LHS. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. All right. So, folks, what we're going to do is that we're going to have, you know, Rob has missed a few of the sessions. So, <laughs> first, we're going to do, uh, you know, Rob talking about everything that he wants to talk about. Then we'll go to Sherry, um, who's going to be talking about some of the things from a continuation from last, uh, last meetup. And then she's going to be talking about parallelism. And then Rupali is going to be talking about the parallelism between the works of Maria Montessori and Louis Sullivan. That's the plan. Rob, you want to stop okay. sharing the screen? Or, or you, you're using I, the I want to keep sharing the screen because there's a couple of things I want to go back to. Uh, now, I missed the awakening of the... I, I think I was partly there for the awakening of the Pentagon. I'm trying to remember. You were in the woodshop. I was in the woodshop. Got it. Well, the one that I wanted to actually get to was this axes with or without sub-axes selected at random. So in, in the section that I just read this parallelism part he talks about he has a base a big deal there about how imagination is the greatest of man's powers and what i found fascinating about this page here that we're looking at with the axes or with, with or without sub axes selected at random what i found interesting is that prior to this he starts with a vegetative form so he starts with leaf forms then he says let's develop do developments based on the leaf forms and he develops it as if, you know, using the same principle as the growing of a biological, of a plant, the growing, a biological process of growth, but sort of developing it into a plant that doesn't really, has never actually really existed, right? A plant that might have evolved had evolution followed these lines, but it's following the, the development that he's giving it from his imagination rather than trying to copy a plant form. But he's still starting with a, a leaf form. And then the next one, he starts with, okay, we're going to start with a geometric form. And he talks about geometry. This is before he does the awakening of the Pentagon. He has a geometric, he talks about geometric forms. So he's starting with a geometric form and then saying, oh, let's expand this geometric form as if it were uh, a biologically growing form and we're having energy coming out of it and all these little nodules and, and efflorescences, these little petal, flower petal type of things. So he's done that starting with a, a an existing plant form from nature starting with a geometrical form and then here he's starting with well i could just make a line on the page as a curve and, a, and anything that i imagine right so you have this one where you have a straight line this is a second from uh, i think it's a second from the right or maybe the third from the right mm, let me see Okay, it's the third from the right, where you have a straight line and then you have a curve off on the right and then a curve off on the left a little higher up. Uh, this isn't a plant form. It isn't a geometrical form. It's just something purely from the imagination. So here he's just saying, you know, we, before we had a plant form and then we took our imagination to develop it and pull the energy out of it in different ways. Then we had a geometric form and we pulled the energy out of it in different ways. And now finally we're starting something that purely comes from the imagination to begin with. We imagine a certain shape, a certain kind of line, making a certain kind of curve. And then we take that and purely coming from man's imagination, projecting out from his imagination, we then can take that and we can develop it and we can grow it and we can, you know, pull all sorts of extra things out of it, energy coming out of it. And that, I think, is what I find fascinating about this section. I think this is where it really gets to where he really wants to go. What he really, really wants to go is we will start from purely from man's power of imagination. We'll imagine a shape, a line, an impulse. And then that will be something that contains energy that we can then pull. And that energy will then, you know, using the method he's used for in the pre all the previous things, that energy will then come out of that. It will burst out of that in various different kinds of forms. Um, and I'm trying to think how much of this we have. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> and that's where he says, so after... This is the bottom half of that same page. He says, uh, any line straight or curved may be considered an axis and therefore a container of energy and a directrix of power. And then he says, there's no limit 
to variations or combinations. So this it's this tremendous sort of uh, it, it, it's a it's a container and director of energy, and there's no limit to it because it comes purely from the imagination. Uh, he says, you know, it could be subdivided, made rigid or plastic or mobile or fluid in every conceivable way. Um, and let me see. There's one last part I wanted to pull out of this. What was it? The line here. Yeah. Uh, and then it, it ends with, uh, if, if, yeah, because probably part of the problem I have is all of your images are overlapping part of the text. So I, I'm yeah. missing something here. There we go. Um, so it's, it's, it requires that the spirit of man breathe upon ideas the breath of his living powers as they stand forth, created in his image, in the image of his wish and will, as demonstrations of man's ego power. So this is like he's getting you the purest idea of the spirit of man is breathing life into these ideas. And so you you start with something that comes from your imagination and then it grows and it has this life of its own that, that from which it develops. So I found that to be a fascinating and illuminating uh, part. I think this really, really wants to go, wanted to go with this. So he then illustrates this. Did you guys cover this? I briefly did, but just mainly because I was going to be tying into this yeah, yeah yeah but i ahead. notice he says here the aspect of freedom is beginning to appear and so the the you have this sort of curly q shape at the top and it's not a plant it's not a geometric form it is a curly q coming out of his imagination and then he should and that's what gives the freedom and then the freedom is also in the fact that he says you could show you can make one axis here or one of these lines dominate you can make the other line dominate you can put them all in balance with each other um and i think it'd be I I sort of did a brief version of this. I think it'd be interesting to go over it and and show how in each of these, you know, which is the main line and which are the subordinate lines, and show how he's emphasized one and push and minimized the other. All right. So, and then he started getting us parallel axes before he talks about parallelism. Um. And let's. Do you want to read that that? Now, I'll read that little text there, because this leads us into our big thing about parallels. It says, note, the natural tendency of axes is towards fluency when once they are liberated from rigid geometry. The initial resultant series of transition stages from inorganic toward organic and the developed stages of fluency are both of limitless variety and scope, and there ceases to be a visible or distinct line of demarcation between them. Thus, we come upon the truth that the creative reality of form lies within a continuous series emanating from a single primal life impulse, seeking and finding manifold expression in form. Life itself is thus manifested as a constant flow into countless multitudes of specific forms. All right, I think this is really important and, and helps us understand what comes next, because he has this idea that, okay, we have the initial impulse of a, a line or a shape that comes to the imagination. We develop it and we, you know, we, we, we create pull energy out of it in all these different ways. But then he's saying there's a next stage beyond that, which is we've done that with one shape. And then what happens is that shape wants to multiply itself. And uh, what's it see? You know, the life, the pri a single primal life impulse seeking and finding manifold expression, right? So think about the natural world, right? If you have, a plant that grows or a seed germ that grows into a plant. What does it do after that? It produces more plants, right? And those plants fill up all the available space, anywhere that is open to them, anywhere that's hospitable to them, it will fill that up. And I kind of see that's what he's doing with the parallelism here. Because he says, you know, life itself is thus manifested as a constant flow into, into countless multitudes of specific forms. So he's basically saying, you know, that that the natural process is that a, a living thing will create itself and then will multiply itself and multiply itself in many copies, filling up basically the entire universe, uh, or to you know to the greatest extent that it can. And that's what he's doing with this idea of okay, I've now created a form out of my imagination. I've developed it, and now I'm going to multiply it like a think of this as like a field of grass right you have one individual blade of grass and then that spreads and you have another blade of grass and then soon you have a field of grass this repeated pattern 
And that's what he's giving us here is we've created a we've created this pattern and developed it and brought it into its flower. And now we're going to multiply it and fill up space with this repeated form. And this is the expression of a life impulse. It's what life itself does uh, when it has the opportunity. All right. <sighs> and there's a, there's a whole, now we don't get back to this doctrine of parallelism. There's a whole lot going on in here. I want to talk a little bit. Do you want to share that or do you want to not share and, and just talk to people? Um, I can pull I, if you up. can pull it up, I will I not. Yeah, I'll pull it off for sure. That way they can see. Yeah. Uh, let me just hold on. I got several sharing. steps to stop sharing. Okay. All right. Doctrine of Parallelism. Because <laughs> his his writing style is so dense. And it's so dense. And also sometimes it's, I, I, I will continue to be frustrated by Sullivan because. It's okay. <laughs> Like he has phrases like this diaphanous labile logic of instinct. I have no idea what a diaphanous and labile logic is. Labile, by the way, means like ever changing. It's a changeable, uh, constantly changing in its form. But how can you, and diaphanous means, you know, sort of clear and see through. Uh, how logic can be labile and diaphanous, I have absolutely no clue. I'm not sure he had a clue. Um, I think he liked the terms diaphanous and labile and wanted to apply them, but I just, it, it lacks the philosophical exactitude that I would like. Um, and I think that, that, that so that comes to a couple of things I want to talk about, which is his use of instinct and mystic, right? So he says, uh, 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 that you have, you know, logic and the intellect is fine, but you have to have uh, it has to be, it cannot be allowed to usurp dominion over instinct. And beneath that, there is instinct. Or uh, uh, intellect is the frail, frailest of man's powers, unless it be held steady and sane by the power of instinct. Now, what does he mean by instinct? And one thing we saw earlier is instinct is, is partly used by him to mean the emotional aspect of life. But there's also something behind that, which is, uh, he says, was it... Uh, that the instinct has a lot involves a logic infinitely more subtle and more powerful because it's primordial. And um, uh, life is of this transcendental logic mm -hmm. and exhibits it first to the instinct and slowly thereafter to the intellect of man. So, and that's up here. And there you go. Yeah. Top of the second column. So transcendental is one of the key words we got to use here because there was a whole system at the time called transcendentalism. And it's this idea that there's sort of like a logic beyond logic. There's something that transcends our observation of the ordinary world. There's a secret knowledge that lies behind the ordinary world. And that also comes, that that's where also this idea, he says that it's called mystic. Where is the mystic part? I'm trying to find in here. Which part are you talking about? Uh, he, he, it's where he introduces mystic. I think it's in this column here. I'm here trying to find it. Or maybe it's not there. But he, he does bring in the term mystic here. Uh, and uh, I think it's where he's talking about that. Oh, yes, yes. It were, it were better in the middle of the first column. They were better in tour to call this domain mystic. For, and and mi I looked up the etymology of the term mystic. And it's an ancient Greek term. Same root word as mystery. It originally referred uh, to the um, the Eleusinian mysteries, where a, a it was like, like a a religious cult in ancient Greece that existed in, in the town of Eleusis outside of outside of Athens. And the mysteries they were really called the mysteries because they were they were religious rites that were secret. That you had to be you had to be inducted. You had to like know the right people and get the right introduction. And now large numbers, it was not, it was sort of one of these secrets where it was like a large number of people where thousands of people in Athens would have been exposed to this. So it wasn't like, you know, it was a tiny group of people. It was a lot, relatively large group of people, but still the idea is that they, there were these religious rites that were secrets and you only the initiated uh, were, were, were able to see what the rites were and to experience and take part in them. And it's considered a major experience that you had gone and participated in these secret rites. And uh, the term mystery comes from that. I think it comes from the idea of covering up the ears and the eyes. The original root of, of mystery comes from that. So it comes from this idea of there being secret or hidden knowledge. 
So that's where the, ter the term mystic and mystery comes from. It's the idea that there is a secret or hidden knowledge that is sort of walled off into a special area and only somebody who's specially selected or, or somehow goes through some sort of special process can, can access that knowledge. And I think that's kind of what he's getting at here with this instinct thing is this idea that we you know that 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 the nature of life is made known first to this to instinct that's this this sort of sub rational instinct, and only later can be possibly drawn out and revealed to the intellect. And so it's mystic because it's this secret hidden knowledge that is on that instinctual level. Now, again, this is the part that drives me nuts about solving because I I really, I don't, I dis, this is the part I disagree with. I don't, I think he's totally wrong about this idea of hidden knowledge. I think, now I think maybe what he's drawing on the idea is, is the idea that there is a subconscious uh, um, uh, experience that you're drawing on, that, you know, as you go through life, you, you gather together all these experiences and observations and they get stored in your subconscious and they're there to be drawn upon. They, they're revealed first to your subconscious in the sense of being absorbed through a lifetime of, of observation and experience. And then you have that to draw on, uh, and, and sort of pull out into your conscious awareness by, and, and therefore make it, uh, available to your intellect. So maybe that's the, the the thing he's referring to, but I, I think that the the way he refers to it as instinct and mystic is drawing from this 19th century context of this idea of there being a you know a hidden reality behind reality and a transcendental uh, logic behind that that's that's different from the logic used by the intellect. Can I crash your party here for a second? Crash my party. Okay, so. I disagree, I think. Oh, okay. I think he is trying his best to kind of describe um, what we've talked about from Ayn Rand's... Um, uh, I wouldn't let you crash. I thought you were going to disagree with me. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> so, um, we, we, we did... Our, I suddenly can't remember the name of the book. Why can't I not remember uh, the name? Romantic Manifesto. Yes, thank you. Romantic Manifesto. I have the abbreviation in my head, but not the words anyway um because remember here he says um i think i think he's talking about a sense of life mm -hmm. but doesn't know how to describe it yet because he doesn't have the philosophical underpinnings that ayn rand had because he talks here um where is this line logic uh he says for life is of this transcendental logic logic it, ex it and exhibits it first to the instinct and slowly thereafter to the intellect of man. So I think he's talking there about the way things come that way. We, we mm -hmm. take them on emotionally based on all the things we've experienced in our lives. And then we get that sort of sense of, you know, diaphanous, he uses that word because you can't quite pin it down at first when it comes to you that way. And then slowly it gets clearer and clearer, less diaphanous, um, and then becomes crystal intellectual logic. Right. So yeah, I disagree. All right. Well, no, I sure don't think we're disagreeing because that's no, I don't kind think of what are. I was saying that I think he's trying to talk about the subconscious. I think it's not that he doesn't have the right terms for it, but he's getting the wrong terms. That he, you know, because I don't think the terms were yet defined. Well, I also, but I also know that the context of this is the 19th century, where mm -hmm. you had the, uh, you had the transcendental American transcendentalists, you had uh, the Hegelians and all these things. You had a a you know the the, the mystic and instinctual part, and and you have Nietzsche going on roughly mm -hmm. just a little bit at, more or less the same time as uh, actually Nietzsche would have been and gone by the time Sullivan wrote this. But that at the time Sullivan was developing these series, Nietzsche was, you know, he has this idea of um, instinct as being this, this set of, of sub-rational drives that you can't really understand. Or even mm -hmm. Freud, you know, Freud has this idea of the unconscious, this set of biological drives and urges that are not subject to, the, to, to introspection by the conscious mind. That idea of there being this sort of hidden reality behind reality and the the, the this transcendental thing this transcendental logic that's beyond you know normal ordinary <laughs> what we, what what we'd actually think of as logic um any ordinary and and reasonable use of the term 
that was very much in the environment at the time. And I think he's sort of getting influenced by that. I think he's trying to describe the idea of something coming up through the subconscious, through the sense of life from observation. But I think he's getting off track there. But I also think this idea... So um, one last thing I, th I was really fascinated by is the idea of... Um, that he says... I. He actually sort of punts here and he says, I almost like apologizes for the fact that, look, I can't, I would really have liked to do this for the advanced student. I would really like to do this without writing all this stuff and just doing a bunch of drawings that you would learn from that. Right? <laughs> so he says, uh, was it uh, to evidence its varied suggestions apart by graphical illustrations would require space far beyond the limits of this work. Um, and so, and you know, I, I he would see it would be how he talks about how interesting it would be to gradually unfold it to the physical eye. So there's this intriguing suggestion that in his mind he couldn't dispense with most of these words and just done, you know, 10 times as many drawings. And by doing those drawings, we would get the idea. <laughs> we would learn the thing he's trying to say. Um, and I think that that's fascinating. But I think we want to go is it the next plate in here? This one. No, I think we're going to go back a plate. Back one. This Be one. No, back before Two. that. Sorry. This yeah, one. this one. Where okay, he... you want to share this one, though? Yeah, let me go back. Because they can't this. tell what this one is. <laughs> uh, I, I know. I know. I'm trying to have you find it from reverse. So let's see. Share screen. It'll be the one page before yeah. that on that slideshow. So oh. hit, hit play and go back one. I got this one. Not hit play. There you go. Okay, so we're back to this page. It's like the value of parallel axes. And there's a, something he says, if you bring up the other, the longer text, where he talks- This one here? The longer text, the whole page, the one we, the long one we just read. The essay on parallelism, yeah, yeah. this one, okay. There's something he says at the end there where he says, um, he describes plate seven and eight. Mm -hmm. And he talks about the introduction of distant parallels and fluent parallels. And I'm trying to figure out what he means by that. He starts here by plate seven is a simple study in two vertical parallel axes. And let's go to plate eight if we have it here. Oh, I don't we don't have know, plate eight. But you can share it from the other document. Oh, I'm not going to worry about that right now. Plate eight is a further study in multiple parallel axes. But one of the things I noticed here, so he has like the idea of like, okay, um, I've developed, he's developed a, a shape and then developed it to a very complex shape. And then he's repeating that shape, but he's also repeating another kind of shape in between those shapes. So it's like uh, I the one in the middle, in this middle band on the far right, uh, that one I found fascinating because the, the shape in the middle there. If you share the other document, you'll be able to zoom into that. Well, I, I'm just going to talk about it here. Okay. The one in the middle there has a plant that's sort of, you can sort of seeing the plant from the side, right? So you have the bench, central stalk and the leaves coming out and a sort of a flower shape on top. So it's like you're viewing the plant from the side. And then in between it is something that looks very much like that flower shape as seen. Oops. Sorry. That flower shape as seen from above. So it's like he's showing you the top view of it and then the side view and then the top view and the side view. So he's going back and forth between them. Um, Can we show that in the other document? So Okay, I'll show it in the other one. Because they, they're, they can't see it. Okay. Go to the place. Go to in here. Yeah. And which plate am I going to Is this, this one? Oh. No. No, that way. Is Down. It that way? Yeah, right there. You there go. we go. Now I can zoom in a little bit and we can see that. Scoot over. So that's what I'm talking about. This one here. You're getting a side. You're getting a... Can you see that, everyone? Am I, am I sharing it? No, not yet. No, we can't, not... we can't see oh. it. I, mean, <laughs> I thought I was sharing it. Okay, here there we, go. we go. Now, can you see So it? this is the one where you're seeing it from the side view, yes. this main stalk and the plants coming up with a whole flower on top. Then at the top, then it looks like there's like a top view of it. But I was particularly fascinated by this one down here, this last one he does, where you have this. No, I'm, I'm going to do the big picture first. You can see his cursor, right, everyone? Yeah, now you can see my yeah. cursor so I can draw your attention. So you have this one that's the same as this one over here. But in between, you've got a different one. And then in between those, you've got, you know, this is the same as this. So you actually have kind of like three things. And, and the assumption here is that you will then 
This one will be repeated off on either side, and these will repeat at each point. So he's adding a lot of complexity to the repetition. So we have um, parallels that are not exactly exact parallels, but are, are variations on the on on the same idea but with you know because we have these extra lines going across here they create some changes that, that require changes so he's showing you basically just indicating the tremendous complexity so by parallelism he doesn't mean simply okay we're going to take the same thing we're going to repeat it we're going to repeat it while alternating something else in between or we're going to repeat it with a larger pattern that then causes us to introduce variations that then get repeated so he's showing, and I, I, that's where he's talking about this idea of a life impulse. And this is how, this is how life works in general. Because you know, if you were to look out in nature, that's exactly what you see. You see a plant reproduces itself, but it's then different. it develops variations, and it develops and mutations, and and other things come in, and other plants come in and fill in in between. And you get this tremendous, you know, uh, infinite in complexity of of life on Earth. So I think that's where he's trying to head with this idea of parallelism. Zoom in on this one. Up Do you here. want to zoom in on that one? Well, because here the intervening spaces, you know, you've got the uh, you got the big squares, and then you have the intervening these, spaces. This littler axis on the inside between the squares. Um, scoot over to that side so they can see that. See how this one here? Can you show them that one? This one here? Yeah, that one is the drawing is is simplified he he kind of has the drawing a little oh, yeah. more yeah, more complex version here yeah so he's version. showing you sort of the structure on the outer edges and then it gets to this final form on the inner edges you can see there that it's it's really the same structure that the main square access with the circle on the inside it's like they have taken that and he's taking it and folded it in on itself like would happen with a seed that hasn't yet, or leaf that hasn't yet hmm. fully formed out. So I find that part really fascinating that you can see in this outer line of drawings that he's really seeing it as the same kind of thing sort of stretched out and wrapped in on itself. All right, so that's, that's what I got out of this last big essay. Excellent, thank you, thank you, Rob. Let me right. stop this for sure. Next up is going to be uh, Sherry. Okay. Um, and Rob just let me crash his party for the one yeah, part that the sense of life issue that I was going to talk about but didn't actually fit within all the other things. So thank you for okay, that. Sure. Um, I remember we talked last week. We brought I brought up plates six and seven, and um, we talked a little bit about four as well. Um, no, we talked. Yeah, three, four, five, six, and seven. We talked about those, and I read through all the text, and we talked briefly about them as we were coming into this essay on parallelism. Um, and what I wanted to make sure we're going to have to, um, you're going to have to be my um, screen share okay. person for this, because um, I'm going to be popping around a couple different places. Um, and the first thing I wanted to bring up was I want to take us this little bit of a step back and look at uh, what this whole entire 24 page document, he kind of gives us a little bit of a layout. Um, he gives us some tidbits in this essay of what he's doing that we might not notice um, on our earlier views through it. And he says here on this essay of parallelism. I'm going to read little bits from throughout it. Towards the beginning, he says, the prelude, that's our four pages at the beginning, the prelude to this series of plates sets forth in literary form man's powers as the foundation of his deeds. And then he goes on and explains uh, that the plates are a development of the technical thesis. Um, they are showing those powers in action as applied to a specific form of activity called architectural ornament. So right there, he's saying applied to a specific activity called architectural ornament. That of course ties back to what the title of this whole work is, but it also tells us that that's a specific application of his idea. He's telling us right there that 
this isn't just about architectural ornament, even though the book is about architectural ornament. This is his clue to tell you this is about something much deeper and greater and more universally applicable than it is just about the specific of architectural ornament. So that's why this is such an important thing to dig into. Um, later he goes on and he says, if I can find the exact spot, um, he goes on, we, we know we've gone through all of these uh, plates that are showing us from the very beginning, we start with a single square and we grow that square out. And he walks us through the process of doing that in organic ways and in organic ways. And he shows us axes and stems and leaf shapes and how they can grow. And he shows us step by step. And if we are drawing along with him, we are getting that in our hand and in our head to understand how this is happening. And then he says here towards the end of one, two, three, four, or five, I can't remember exactly how many paragraphs back, in the end of this essay, he says, it is deemed urgent to devise this literary interlude. And so there he's saying, it's urgent for me to stop for this interlude, this one page essay. So he's gone all this way through, showing us from the very, very basic to the more and more complicated. But then he says, it's urgent to devise this literary interlude because to evidence its varied suggestions apart by graphical illust graphic illustrations would require space far beyond the limits of this work. So, this is his way of saying, wait, we got to stop here for a second because there's something important that I need to tell you. And he needs to tell us to not our exterior eye, but our inner eye. He needs to tell us something intellectually. Um, and Rob said that he, he kind of he kind of describes this as, I'd love to just be able to have all these pages that you can see it unwind slowly yourself. I think it's absolutely critical that he doesn't do it that way because I think we miss something when we do it that way because there's a change that happens from this essay to the end of the work. And he tells us what that's about in a way. So he comes down here and says, what this work may lack in scientific continuity of gradual illustrations must be compensated by continuity in sensibility and thought by the student. Then he goes on the next paragraph. Such process may proceed either way as a sentient development on an intellectual background or as an intellectual development, development on a sentient background. The illustrations may be traced back to their primitive origins, or the primitive origins may be followed in their expanding development. So, and then he goes on to this little technical issue about plates seven and eight, but can you, sh can you bring up the, the list of plates? Yes, I can. Am I sharing screen to? Um, yes, those. And we were there. But... So, yeah, let's. Can you go back to the beginning of this document? So, I have oh, a. That's the first thing. Yeah, that's the first one. Go there um, and share screen. Oh, I share screen. You're right. I'm sharing screen. Am I sharing can screen? Can you see? It? Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. good. Make Yay. Sure. So, I have um, a series of photographs taken of just the plates. What I've pulled out of this document, and actually I didn't pull it out, I never put it in. <laughs> when I was at the Special Collections Library, I wanted to get um, a better quality image of just the plates. So I didn't photograph the text pages, the four pages at the beginning and this one page interlude. Um, and 
I think that's been really clarifying because as we're going to scroll down through these, remember we start here and remember in our minds, the illustrations may be traced back to their primitive origins or the primitive origins may be followed in their expanding development. We're seeing here the primitive origins following in their expanding development. We see here with the very first plate. Um, can you steer? I don't know how to use your shirt. Sure. <laughs> Rob, I, Rob's, we're yes. using Rob's computer. Yeah, go to the next one. So here we started again with its primitive shape of leaves. And we're, can you scroll down on this page? And we've seen the more complicated version and then go to the next. So then here we're getting it in the inorganic where we're talking about simple shapes and polygons and we start from the simple and we're getting the more complex it's expanding development keep going and same thing here when we're awakening the pentagon starts at the pentagon and expands from there and then we talked about stems and the same thing keep going scrolling down so here we have in this particular one He's showing us at the top of this, there's three different axes. We remember we're studying the simple axes and then it expands from there. And he's showing us that you can expand it on A, you can expand it on B, you can expand it on C. Each one of those can be dominant or scroll to that one, or you can have all of them kind of an equilibrium. Again, he's starting from the simple and expanding from there. Keep going. And then this one, he's doing it, but in parallel. He's showing you that approach in parallel. So what happens when you have multiples of a thing? And we're seeing that they don't, they, they can be like this image on the top. Can we scroll up to see that one? That looks very much like Frank Lloyd Wright's stained glass. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like wheat field um, or hollyhocks um, or tree of life we're seeing something that's very, very similar. Each axis is like an earlier and later version of the same. And we see in these later ones, the second row here, each axis is different. Um, can you scroll into this one? Zoom in here. So this one here, you have this first axis, this main one kind of is a background axis. It's almost like a a square form that's stretched out. And then the secondary axis is this four leaf shape. Well, they're both fours. So there's probably some connection between the one axis and the next. Um, and we're not totally aware of it, but if we look, you can see there's that background line drawings in there. He's kind of alluding to that. And as we scroll back out so we can see the other version. So these others that we're showing, I mean, Rob showed this one at the end. Each one of these, as you go on further to the right, becomes a little more complicated between the main axis and the secondary axis to this one here, where it looks like we're seeing the flower axis in, um, in the center. That's almost like seeing the flower or the plant shape in elevation. And in these squares, we're almost seeing it in plan form. So think he's an architect. Plans and elevations are everything. But if you scroll out to the whole page, if you look at all of these, starting from this first illustration of wheat fields at the top and the second line starting left to right, each axis is a different type of axis. They're not just different things it's like the first one is a more simple version and the second one they're changing it up completely by the time you get to the last one there he's now playing with elevations and plans of one particular plant form and then when you get to this does drafting masterpiece at the bottom you have three different primary axes and then you've got a series of angles that are rather shallow, like that are crossing over three axes. And then you've got sharper angles that repeat here, up and down. There's such complexity in here, but he's showing you on the edges 
how he got there. And why is he showing you how he got there? It's because he's showing you the primitive origins following to their expanding development. But then, scroll on to the next. He shows, pauses us at this one. Um, this is plate eight. It's the only single form before we get to that interlude. After the interlude, every single plate is like this, where it is a complete thing by itself without any drafting lines. They're complete works by here. So this is the first time in here that we're seeing a completely illustrated form. It's like he's been, and you see, we've got, we've got the, we've got very much the organic, the plant form, very much the inorganic, the, the geometric forms. We have axes vertically, horizontally, curvilinear, angled. He's put everything in here. And then he pauses to tell us this really important thing that this work that this work lacks in scientific continuity of gradual illustration must be compensated by the continuity in sensibility and thought by the student. So right after we see the grand piece here of everything else all put into one, he pauses for one page essay. And then he goes to the rest of these illustrations. Well, and does he say in there, the illustrations should be traced back to the primary board? Yes, that's what I'm getting to. Okay. So this is the illustrations that come afterwards. And there's no description other than there's a plate, other than his signature, and other than the date that they were made. And each one is very, very different from the next. And you don't have everything all in one. You have kind of an emphasis. Each one of them has its own emphasis. Keep scrolling. Oops. So as we see these, because we've been going through each one of these assignments, hopefully drawing physically each one of these assignments, we should instantly start seeing, ah, well, this is an axis. This is a parallel. This is an axis in a plant form. This one is much more in the inorganic form. Scroll to the next. And this one's much more in the A and B kind of twining axis. Scroll on. And what I think he is telling us here is the rest of these plates, I think he's telling us to do this first part. The illustrations may be traced back to their primitive origins. I think he is inviting us students to take each one of these further plates and work backwards back to the original squares or circles or lines. Now, there is a couple of places like this one does have some text to it. He says here, note, the energy comes from the characteristic seed germ imagined. The main stalk then differentiates into eight specialized leaf forms, which in turn differentiate. There being no limit to character expression, this design lies within the field of romance. Let's go back down and show the rest. This one's called an impromptu, which I think is interesting. It's a, actually a musical form. Yeah, and what is the musical form? Musical form is a short piece that's meant to sound like it, it was, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like it was done improvisationally. And doesn't it? Yeah. It's so supposed to be very free-flowing and complex. Mm -hmm. 
So you're getting little tiny bits of text to kind of give you some bit of clue. This one's a little of, of both inorganic with touches of organic. And this one as well, you really have that parallel uh, issues coming on in this one. I think that one is the, no, this is, is this the last one? Plate 19. I have the number of plates listed here. Oh, one more, plate 20. Yeah, this one's really faint. I'm sorry. You might want to zoom in. This one's very, very light. This is like a chandelier at a, uh, at a very fancy. <laughs> yeah, but... Um, and again, I I really, you can unshare, I think. Yeah. Um, I really think it's important for us to see these in person when you can get to a special collections library near you. But I think what he's telling us in that second section, that last section after his um, interlude is all of those completed works are there for us to figure out how did he get there? Um, yeah, I, th I think there's a sense that he's done explaining. Yeah, he's done doing gradual steps to get you there. From here on out, I'm just going to give you the final finish thing, and that your job as the student or the observer to work back to how did what's behind this, how did it come to be. And that's my final um, homework assignment for you: is take whichever of those is your favorite, or take them all if you'd like to take the time to do into that, dig into that, and find that that pattern that comes from it work yourself backwards um essentially erasing but not really you could probably best to do it in trace paper that you can lay over and and work your way through but probably the best way is to take with the original trace it and then laying trace paper over try to peel the pages, the details back one by one. Now I know what Srikant's, I can see that in his face right now. I know he's thinking, how on earth am I going to do that after I've made these shapes out of um, 3D forms? Uh, <laughs> and I'm very eager to see what you do with that. But that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see you now take the completed work and work your way the other direction because everything does go in both directions. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. And thank you, Rob. Uh, Rupali, I had a question for you. I do want to talk about this parallelism and everything that um, Rob and Sherry have put together. Um, what's your situation? Uh, is it okay if we have a little bit of discussion on what Rob and Sherry said, and then we can go to Montessori and this comparison because I want to stay on. Is that okay? All yes. Right. Um, so um, would you like to comment on this or shall I go ahead and comment? Why don't you comment and then I'll comment. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. So so firstly, on, on Sullivan, I'm, I'm in Sherry's camp, not Rob's camp. For me, you know, this entire... And, and the way I read these people whom I like is that I read everything multiple times. So, and you have to work. I mean, it's clear. It, basically, this is poetry. Mm -hmm. This is poetry. This is really not prose. And you kind of have to get the entire corpus and understand what is being said and what words are being used. And when somebody is breaking new ground, they have to use words in different ways. Like you, if you've seen Buckminster Fuller, you know, he just makes up terms, uses terms in very different ways. And that's actually quite required in order to shake people up. Otherwise, you know, they're going to just produce in their mind exactly what everybody has been thinking about. And that's what he's doing here. And um, so I, I like his writing very much. I, I find it to be extremely clear uh, in terms of, because it is like you're trying to put together his buildings, all his writing, all the references to a concept, and then relating it to it. So for example, uh, you're absolutely right, Rob, when he's talking about, um, you know, instinct is just talking about the subconscious that is filled up. And you're saying, okay, you can't, what happens is like uh, Ayn Rand used to say, 
the great artists are harbingers, things that are only at the edge of consciousness, of, of a time, they grab onto those and they give expression to it. That expression is not initially a conceptual, you know, it's not presented, you know, this, 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 this as an argument. It is like the statue of David coming out of the Middle Ages. This is what man can be. Okay, now if you asked Mike Michelangelo to talk about it, he won't be able to do it. But nobody else would be able to do it either. Huh. He's breaking new ground at that time. And that's exactly what Sullivan is doing on many, 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 many different levels here. And so that's why I give a little bit of um, leeway to him because I, I think we are looking at somebody written writing 100 years ago and he's actually very different from all the other people he's taking some of the themes of the transcendentalist he's far more grounded than all the trans transcendentalist far more grounded so even when he's using the same word it means completely different so for example let's take the concept of imagination again and again and again and again and again throughout his work he says Train yourself by listening to life, to reality, to nature. Make that a part of you. Otherwise, you will have no imagination. Whatever imagination you have is just uh, chimera. You know, you might as well not have imagination. If you have that, if you're if you've learned from reality so that it becomes fluid expression within you, now you have true imagination. And he has all of this, you know, in various places. So all of, when he says imagination is the most important faculty, all of that is being carried. That imagination as conditioned by lifetime of letting life break in upon you and you expressing yourself, doing that over and over and over and over again throughout your life, you're able to do that. Again, when he says limitations of intellectual things, he's criticizing people who, regards ideas as idols, you know, who take as, you know, uh, Leonardo Strom, who is also in the same category, he's breaking new ground. So he says, those that, them, that deck themselves in the works of others will not allow me dignity of my work. So they don't know what work is. They're just carrying these words with them. And it's that, the, it's that what he's saying that, you know, these are the clothes that people are wearing and they have not actually have no idea where the clothes come from, where expressions come from. And it is that that he's criticizing. Um, so I want to go through the, you know, several points here. One, I want to point out that there is one concept that he just touches on, which is a core concept, which he has not actually explicated himself, explicated here, or I, I have not seen it anywhere explicated. And he's saying it is about the new conception of energy. Mm -hmm. okay. This is like back and forth, back and forth, back and forth that is happening between various centers and how they work. Uh, all of that. He has a very elaborate idea of that. And he's using that very consistently throughout his work. You can see it in design. You can see it in words. But he's not explicated that. Okay. Um, second, the core idea here that he uses is that of sympathy. You're saying that there is commonality in nature. There is commonality. There is a parallelism between reality itself, what a human being is, what his works are, and he's actually playing around all those commonalities. And that sympathy so each human being has sympathy for the other, hum other human beings. If you're trying to do the same things, if you're trying to create the same things, there is a commonality you have. And there is a lot of interaction that takes place, which is implicit. He's also kind of pointing to that implicit interaction that is taking place. So the sympathy is a very large idea and it's, it's intimately connected with his idea of instinct or of you know, the subconscious, your emotions. Your, you can feel that first about other people or other works of art. You will react to the work of art without knowing exactly what about that music is doing what to you. You will just react to it. So you will have sympathy in, in that way. So that's what he's pointing to, that our, we have very large brains. Our ability to 
see an integration, see a connection before we can fully explicate it. He's also a very big fan of explicating it. You know, he's the guy who says, unless, you know, he's the guy who came up with form follows function. You know, he says, unless I have something which is a universal idea, I, I found all other ideas to be useless. So he's very much pro-intellectual, but he puts it in the right context of saying in, intellectual doesn't mean just have some ideas that somebody else has produced, but commune directly with reality and produce ideas uh, based on that. Um, the uh, Let's see here. The other large point here is that it's, all these drawings are very beautiful. Okay, all just incredibly beautiful. And that on one hand comes from the patterns in nature itself, okay? But you have to remember that nature does not have this, look at all the plates, it doesn't have that, okay? So there is a miss, there is something. He's saying, learn something from nature, but don't forget that you are a man. Exactly. You have the power of understanding the patterns of nature and then creating something which is far beyond nature because nature works through evolution. Evolution is simply create variations. You know, that's Darwinian. It's Darwinian, it's three steps. Evolution works in three steps. One is that, you know, this is the original formulation of Darwin on the little piece of paper that he had. First is that grandchildren like grandparents. So there is a transmission of the same pattern. Second is the slight variation between them in all kinds of direction, not one direction, all directions. And then fecundity beyond ability of the environment to support so that things that are not effective die out. Okay, that's how evolution works. Man does not work like that. Man can work like that, but then it, he's at a much lower level. You know, chimpanzee can work like that very effectively. And they're very effective because they've got large brains. Okay. But man can go beyond that. So what he's saying is that take in that pattern that is there in nature. Identify it. Make it fluid in your hands. And now say what can be and what should be. And build that. So the kind of sympathy, the kind of networks that human beings can produce. That's what civilization is. You know, civilization is not a product of biology. It is the product of quintessentially human will, ability to conceptualize, ability to see these patterns, make them into words and stones and ways of interacting with each other. That's what it makes, but that's what he's talking about. And he's showing you how to do that. So it is, the, the biological part is only the starting point. And he's going much, 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 much beyond that. Now, we don't have the vocabulary to really do justice to that level. Okay, so, you know, people kind of keep, I mean, and he is one of the people, it's, this is 19th century, okay, who's seen what human beings can do. He's full of optimism about what human beings can do. He looks at people around them, around him and says, what is this? Why are you not human? And that's the context in which he's talking. And he is an harbinger. He's showing you what is possible. So that's that's how what I get from it. Um, so, uh, Rupali, Rob, or Sherry? Oh, just a second. Uh, Iris has raised her hand. Let's go. Give me just a second. Let me unmute everybody. Go ahead, Iris. Okay. I, I have something uh, to share. Uh, it's a Sullivan design, uh, and it really goes with what Sherry's been talking about. And it's kind of a bridge to Rupali because it's in the colors of uh, those stems behind her. 
Okay, let's see if I can make this work. Wow. Okay, this is uh, a freeze from the Chicago uh, Stock Exchange Trading Room by 1893-1894. And uh, if you were to do uh, just the pencil lines, they're identical. And all of the changes are caused by the color. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's in twos up here. And uh, I, things at the base seem very different. Uh, there's a green cross in some of it. It turns out there's an ochre cross in the others. It's ex identical, except the ochre cross goes into you know, gets lost uh, in the ochre pattern. Anyway, it's it's been one of my favorite things, and I see it differently now after listening to Sherry. It's really wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. Rupali. Well, thank you. Uh, I want to thank Rob for reading the interlude. That was beautiful. Uh, it always helps to listen to it again um, you know, there's so many things that pop out every single time differently. Um, and Rob, you did a wonderful job of showing those plates one by one, and it helped to kind of see the details in all the plates, how they are similar, but also different. And, uh, and Shrikant, what you said about, um, what is civilization, right? That it's not just a biological thing. And I think we discussed this um, in Buckminster Fuller's presentations too. And also in um, when we did kindergarten chats that it is the action, the humans that take, that build the life here. So yeah, I, I think this, uh, it really, it's such a short essay, but so powerful, so packed. Uh, with everything. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to doing Sherry's homework. Uh, it's it's not going to be easy because every plate is so beautiful. Uh, so looking forward to that. All right. Uh, Rupali, do you want to go ahead and make the presentation on uh, Montessori and Sullivan? Sure. So I want to... Uh, share just one screen here and uh, so this is a sari that my parents gave me so i just pulled it out uh, that my parents gave me when i became an architect and it's very special to me because Typically, Indian saris have a lot of floral motifs. I've talked about that in the past, um, that, you know, motifs in Indian fabrics are derived from the tree of life or from nature. But this particular sari uh, talks about the human uh, human mark on, on the world, you know. So it's the industry, the the construction in the background, you can see the buildings, you can see the uh, the boats in the front and then some airplane like things in the top. And there are two freezers on the bottom and two, one on the top. And um, it also, when I was thinking about parallelism, I thought about the sari because you have these vertical lines of the mast. Uh, of the ships and then you also have the vertical lines of the buildings in the background but then you have the angular movement of the umbrellas on the beach and the triangles on the top um, the waves on the bottom let me see if I can show yeah so here you can see this more in depth and this is all with silk threads and it's um, you know so you can see the different shapes within that panel. And um, even the waves have some kind of a foliating shape at the bottom. Uh, there's the geometric uh, you know, design for the waves. 
and I like the circles on the uh, on the mast on the sails that this fabric has. So I um, thought I would share this sari just because it goes in very well with <laughs> what we are talking about. So when Sherry read, uh, she talked about the prelude and why we need to take this pause. Why is it important to take this pause? I want to just talk a little bit about that, that Sullivan is talking about man's natural, natural powers and that these powers are the foundation of the work that man does. So what we create is based on these... Um, inherent powers that we all have. So so what have we learned so far? Um, that, you know, just like a seed germ, every human being has the potential to flourish. We have the potential to explore and realize our own work using our own imagination and creativity. So we can have several axes in which we can develop our own uh, interests and work so um, when we look at nature and um, we've talked about the vitality and the vigor with which nature grows. So Louis Sullivan reminds us to grow with that same, to, to express our creativity with the same vitality and vigor uh, with the variations. And all of those are the choices we make. So he talks about the freedom of choice that we, we have. Um, and that that choice we make is based on the values we hold. So in his book, Kindergarten Chat, he uh, chats, he talks about uh, what, what are you? Like, what is your worth? Are you just the value of uh, the money in your bank account or are you more than that? And so the choices we make really comes from the values we hold. So he's reminding us of that. And that, um, with all of this, his focus now is on the human being. There, so therefore here he stops for a uh, literary explanation of, uh, you know, what what are we? We are, we are doing this thesis um, to expose human powers in action. And the way he is using the form is the architectural ornamentation. And I wanted to say that, you know, uh, Maria Montessori, who was an educator, she expresses this in form of education. Um, so both of them are talking about the human possibilities. I also really like the way he looks at science and art. And then he says science and art are considered as parallel things. Sometimes the sci I, I often see with... Um, with adults when I work um, in training them, that they'll say, oh no, I'm not an artist. And if if they break that barrier, they can really create something beautiful. But there is this mental block. Um, and then people who are artists will say, oh no, I can't do that math or I can't think about it in a scientific way. But Louis Sullivan reminds us in this essay that when these two really come in unison, that's where the philosophy just uh, kind of blossoms. And you have this philosophical approach to life that is not separate from science or art. And that's where he's talking about this, um, uh, this mystic domain that this, the intellect, the instinct, imagination, all coming together, working together for the human being to be able to create. Um, so I like the word he, the words he uses in this uh, essay. He says, a sense of parallel gradually enters seemingly nebulous domain, which we here call parallelism. And Maria Montessori, uh, uses the same word nebulae in her writing about children and about human beings. And she's, I mean, I just read what she says about nebulae. So this is from her book, Formation of Man. 
She says, a comparison could be made with the nebulae from which heavenly bodies originated. These nebulae are almost insubstantial masses of ethereal gases without consistency, which yet slowly solidify and transforming themselves become stars and planets. And I think it ties really well with what Louis Sullivan is saying, is this is all amorphous. And when he says this diaphanous, uh, labile logic of instinct, I think this is what he is saying, is it's this, this amorphous area and it's all going to come together and some pieces are going to come together to form a reality. Rupali, and, that is beautiful. That's excellent. This is just very apt. It's exactly that, what he's talking about, that you have this and out of which condenses the star. So thank you. Continue, please. Okay. Well, thanks to Maria Montessori. Those are not my words. So I just read that. <laughs> All right. Um, and the other thing that I, I love this sentence, man stands by virtue of his powers, a solitary ego within a universe of energy, a witness, a participant, and by virtue of his powers, a co-creator. This is amazing because he is saying, just like what Shikant you mentioned, that we are not just um, evolving in a biological way. I think um, I uh, I forget the name. Um, we we had done a series of his. Um, it's oh, it'll come to me. It's. Uh, Bronowski? Bro. Yeah, Jacob Bronowski, yeah. Jacob Bronowski, yes. So he says that, you know, humans have not just evolved in a biological way, but also in a cultural dimension. And I think this is where Louis Sullivan and Maria Montessori say that humans are here to create. We are participants. We have the power to create, which really separates us from any other living form. And but both Maria Montessori and Louis Sullivan talk about going back to nature to, to learn from nature. And Louis Sullivan has done a fantastic job in this book uh, of showing how to go to how to go back to nature, take inspiration from there, and then use your imagination to, to create what you will. So Maria Montessori was um, she was a physician. She was um, born in Italy in 1870. She uh, then, she was interested as a young girl, she was interested in math and uh, science. She uh, went on to become a physician and she was, she was tasked with working with children who were mentally uh, deformed and while working with them, she realized she found some uh, basic universal laws that apply to all children. And she found that children love to work. They love to work with their hands. They love uh, to engage. And they're not just learning with tools, but they're learning from the environment. They're just soaking it all in. And that development where children just taken from the environment is that psychic nature of the child, which is different than how adults learn. Uh, in this book, In Formation of Man, Maria Montessori uses language as an example of how children learn. And she says, you know, for the first two years of life, children really don't speak. They, they are babbling and but they have an absorbent mind. So this is her term, the absorbent mind. They're just taking it all in like a sponge. And by soaking it in, when they're two, there's a language expo explosion or a sensitive period for language when they start forming complete sentences. Nobody has taught them at that point what the alphabet is or 
what grammar is or how sentences have to be formed or what uh, stories they can create. They're just making it making it their own by soaking in what they've heard from their parents, grandparents, people around them, and then uh, using their uh, voice to say things. So Maria Montessori says that this is a very unique way of learning, that it's, you know, it's inherent in all of us. That is a natural creative impulse. So that's a natural creative uh, psyche. And I think when uh, Louis Sullivan is talking about the mystic domain, and Rob, if you're hearing, I'm on Louis Sullivan's team too, with Sherry and Shrika. <laughs> because here's what it's happening is, you know, we are not just learning through our, in, uh, our uh, powers of the intellect. We are learning also through the power of instinct, which is, a, and he says that it's the primordial power it it comes it's there in all li living beings that life force that you know we don't need to be taught we can just learn some of those well after that all the technical part that you have to learn is through the intellect and the way we articulate is through our ability uh, to make logical sense but that's where louis sullivan and maria montessori talk about the psychic development or the mystery or the mystic part. And Maria Montessori emphasizes um, this mystery quite often in her work. So um, she, let me just read this. See, she, she said that, um, you know, all throughout her uh, career as um, an educator and a teacher trainer, she meant she mentions that education must follow the universal laws of human development as they are revealed in the lives of actual children. And she was very specific about saying, follow the child, just like um, Louis Sullivan says, form follows function, she would say, follow the child. Now, where this is a misunderstood concept because when people say follow the child, they feel they should follow all their idiosyncrasies and, you know, their um poor behavior or um demands but that's not what she means she means that there is a natural law if, by which children are going to develop and just like the seed is going to become a sapling the sapling is going to grow some branches and grow longer and taller then it's going to have buds and flowers and then it's going to have fruits similarly children have a path where they unfold um, their personality as they grow and we have to follow that path to teach them as opposed to giving telling them what the adult ideas are about whatever's going on at that time in society or the social norms so she she's very particular in saying don't impose your ideas as adults on children because that's not what they need and so in that sense i think uh, maria montessori and louis sullivan are similar that they both believe um, that there is this inherent instinctive power that we have by which we absorb the environment and learn and education should be geared in that manner. In this book, Louis Sullivan is actually taking us through those steps as adults. And Maria Montessori does that through her um, pedagogy in, in children. So um, Maria Montessori goes on to say that, you know, uh, look at nature. And she says, all things are part of the universe. All are connected with each other to form one whole unity. Again, Louis Sullivan is saying, look at the whole picture and then go to the parts. Maria Montessori is saying the same thing. Everything is connected. Look at the whole and then go to the parts. So there's an inherent harmony in nature. And although it seems like uh, these are all varied forms, they all have 
a similar uh, base and which we've seen through this work of access that uh, Louis Sullivan has talked about. And um, what Maria Montessori in one of her uh, series of lessons, uh, she talks about the cosmic curriculum for the elementary children. She talks about the role of different things in nature. What is the role of the mountain? What's the role of the oceans? What's the role of the sun? What's the role of the trees? And what's the role of the wat water that exists? What's the role of uh, human beings? And what's your role in this world? Everybody is doing their job. Every item in this universe is uh, doing, you know, is true to their function. In that manner, what is your job and how can you create, how can you participate in this world? And that's a big question that's part of the Montessori elementary curriculum. So when a child is between seven to 14 years of age, that's what she is talking about. Now she uh, spent seven years in India. She was a devout Catholic. So she had, uh, you know, some of this um, spiritual work that she talks about comes from her background, as well as her work in India, where she um, spent time reading the Gita. She worked with the children there. And through her observation that irrespective of which religion, which geography, which area you grow up in, all human beings have the same needs or the same desires to, to flourish. So uh, in her philosophy, she talks a lot about freedom and choice that children, just like adults, desire to have that freedom. Um, Louis Sullivan calls that democracy. He says, you know, human beings want that freedom. They want to be able to make choices. And it is through the choices that we make and the free will that we have that we create the works. And then those works become a reflection of the human being. So uh, he talks a lot about the, the man and his deeds that are uh, integrated. So um, another thing, uh, Maria Montessori, continues to say is that the world was not created for us to enjoy, but we are created in order to evolve the cosmos. So similarly, again, going back to the idea that, you know, we are participants in this world. She talks about children as workers. She talks about children's desire to use their entire body to, to create things, to work. So uh, she doesn't believe in having <clears throat> a traditional classroom with where the teachers at the head of the classroom and children are working at desks all day long. She actually writes in her book that that is so harmful for children's backs and also for their posture to, to sit in a chair for hours. Uh, instead, it's natural for them to lie down on the floor, spread their work um, on a mat, maybe sit on the floor, chat with another friend, walk around, uh, stop and ponder, stop and observe, take in what somebody else is doing in the classroom and then continue with their work. That's a more natural way of learning. So when, when she is saying, look at nature and how nature is uh, working, we see this with three-year-olds. Three-year-olds in the classroom, they're not necessarily busy doing one work or the other. They they sit with the five-year-old and they're just in awe watching the five-year-old polish the silver or or uh, work on the odd and even uh, counters. And then they, they sit with them, they walk away, they go, they string some beads and uh, they make a pattern. They might go do some pouring activity and then they sit with an older child again, just watching them. But it's that through through observation that they are learning. It's not just by rote memorization or by practice, practice, practice that they're learning. And Louis Sullivan is kind of encouraging us to do the same. He's saying, 
go to nature look at look at what's happening make it your own and then you will have um a way to express it in the form that you find most suitable uh, in his case it's architectural ornamentation wow rupali that was wonderful i what i want to do is i want to build on that because i want to bring in another theme because i think this is a great opportunity to look at uh, parallelism um jacob brunowski i i love that series ascent of man his last episode is longest childhood and he says child you know in the traditional cultures children are pointed to these you know he i think it was uh, the easter island statues the shows like this is the adult which is what you are going to you should become whereas in the west the ideal is that of a child of maintaining that curiosity to give you another example my favorite example on this is newton at the end of his life now the, everybody else was saying oh we have now figured out everything and he's the guy who did it and his reaction is that you know i don't know what i might seem like to other people but as to myself i seem to have been like a little boy playing on the seashore who discovered some shells shinier than others while the entire ocean of truth remains undiscovered that is the idea of mystery of saying that reality is very large and we don't know most of it whatever i know is limited and i have to be continuously open to reality and that is exactly the feeling of sullivan so sullivan and newton have exactly the same reaction say it's the same thing that that uh, brunowski is saying is that it's all about having and actually building the curiosity you see in people like leonardo da vinci at the end of his life he's always asking you know so what what was done and what is it, his curiosity keeps increasing <laughs> with his knowledge um and that is the idea of the long childhood which um which brunowski captures so well another aspect in the same series is that he's talking about a scientist and he gives an example of a sculptor and he says you will ask me i'm talking about scientist why do i bring in sculptor this is it is the i brain and hand connection that loop that is responsible for all production so a scientist is actually going through that loop in some ways you know in modern times we've separated out these things we've broken these things up montessori louis sullivan and brunowski are arguing for this loop of man doing this incessantly with full cognizant of the large things you know the large largeness of reality that is surrounding them and that's you know sullivan has his own way of expressing it montessori has her own way brunowski has his own way and these are odd men out actually in you know these are like 19th century 20th century people most people say oh you know like mo most quote unquote scientists they say oh we know we know how to do this we, it's it's all done uh and well newton will say no 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 <laughs> there is more um and so so that's that's one thing now on parallelism i wanted to and on this conception of energy see all of good things that all of us are familiar with montessori so i want to actually look at a montessori classroom right now of saying how does parallelism work in a montessori classroom because i think it's a great example of parallelism you have all these children you have all these teachers you have all the materials look at how much parallelism is going on between all of these things you can see that you know there is a design of the so just look at classroom okay montessori classroom and let's talk about parallelism's operative so who would like to go first 
Sherry, would you like to start? Well, I think we probably should be starting this one. <laughs> go ahead, Sherry, go ahead. Um, there, one of the things I think is really fascinating because um, our youngest is about to graduate from uh, a seventh, eighth grade classroom in a Montessori environment every grade level or group age level has a different type of classroom, which I find fascinating, um, that they change as the needs of the child changes. But um, you have, like Shrikant was mentioning, a parallelism of all these individual kids, each on their individual path throughout the day, um, following their own choices in learning but they're all massively absorbing everything in the classroom but you also have a parallelism in the classroom of areas of study you'll have a practical life section um, where they're polishing the silver they're washing the dishes they're making a snack for themselves and their classmates um, you'll have a math section where they're counting beads um, and learning their it, it eventually not in the, I mean, you could count them in the children's house, but eventually you're getting um, much more complex than that. But, but, but in the children's house, they're still, they go from the beads to um, the bead chains to the, the blocks where they're, they're blocks 10 by 10 um, and they're counting. They sometimes they have to go to the other classroom to gather more beads because they're counting higher than that. Um, but you also then have the language section where it's about the learning the letters and, and the sandpaper letters. And um, there's a geography section on, there is a, a place to feed the fish or the gerbil or whatever classroom creature they're caring for. Every classroom has a different one. So there are so many parallels just within that section of subjects. Um, it's just so many multi layers uh, that it takes a very long time to start to understand all of them. Um, and the outcome on the other end is just a night and day difference. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Rob, would you like to add anything? No, I think she covered it really well. <laughs> uh, Rupali, what do you think? Oh, uh, can I share a video? Please. Okay. Let me see. Um... Before you play, uh, you have to select the sound. That oh, any... uh, and where, where should I select the sound? Uh, so when, when you're sharing, when you bring up, hit share, there is a checkbox over there. Okay. Okay, while uh, Rupali is bringing it up, Rupali, you can continue to bring it up. I just want to comment on a couple of things that um, she said. I think, you know, I deliberately wanted to start with Sherry because she has, you know, as a largely kind of a consumer of this, at the same time, you know, being involved in the school, et cetera, each, you know, each perspective is different. Um, and it's really amazing to see how the environment itself, the point that you made, that all of the, environment is available, all the things you could do. I would also add that Montessori is cognizant of all of man's powers that Sullivan is talking about. And all of them have been explicitly thought about and are being implemented uh, in, in, in the classroom. Uh, go ahead, Rupal.
that's um, you know a quick. I thought I instead of me telling a lot, it's better to I share. Want to point, I, I want to just say one thing. Let's go a little bit back and forth. The thing I really like is that imagine these kids, you know, same kids that you saw in a traditional classroom. Okay, they would be sitting in these things, and only one thing will be coming at them. Okay, this is the exact opposite of parallelism. You know, they are being put in these boxes, which are chairs and desks, right? Can't move. No movement in any direction. Stop all axes. No axes. Okay, only one axis. Look at the teacher. The teacher is going to give you only one thing. Okay, just look at that. Now, doesn't matter whether you already know it and are bored out of your mind or you are so far behind that you don't know what is going on. Doesn't matter. You just have to focus on that at that speed. I mean, this is exactly opposite of the parallelism. Whereas parallelism means it, it, it has profound respect for the mind, the soul, the spirit, the will of each human being, each of the child. And they are interacting with one another. They are interacting with the material. They are interacting with the teacher who has a bigger picture, who can see the patterns of how the energy is flowing. And there is tremendous energy circuits that are going on between children, as you, you know, as you were describing between the three-year-old and five-year-old. And that is crucial. And the five-year-old is not doing something for the, for the three-year-old. They are pursuing their own axes. The three-year-old is not doing something for that five-year-old. They are pursuing their own axis as and when they choose. The result of this is actually building of the ability to direct energy in a very flexible way ac across multiple disciplines, individually as well as socially, at a low level of ability to high level of ability. All of these are variables and you have this design, like Sullivan-esque design, if you will, operating in the classroom. And that is beautiful. Go ahead, Rupali. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's amazing. And you know, you asked the question, what happens to these children if they were not in the Montessori school? Some of our students came from traditional classrooms and they were in principal's office most of the day. And when the parents see them now, now they are middle schoolers or have graduated from a school and they are confident, happy, creative individuals who can express themselves so eloquently. Um, but by just putting the child in a stifling environment, you, you just cut out all their creativity and uh, it's... Um, it's a damage. I think uh, in the Romantic Manifesto, Ayn Rand talks about this. She says, it's the damage that's done to the to the mind, but you can't see it. I mean, imagine if you see uh, a child who um, is stifled so that the arms or legs might not work. You can see it, but you can't see this damage in the, the mind. Uh, but that's exactly what, uh, you know, uh, the education system that does not follow the child's natural development does to the child and maria montessori says at the present age of present stage of civilization one of the most eminent perils is that of going against nature's law in education of the child to suffocate and deform him under the error of common prejudices so you know you talk about Ayn Rand, Sullivan, Buck, Buckminster Fuller, uh, Maria Montessori. They all say the same, same thing. I do want to just point out 
one other part that um, I, I uh, really liked. Uh, he, Louis Sullivan talks about the powers of uh, imaginative will. He says that is the highest power. He then goes on to say he may, it may be here in, uh, injected that imagination is the greatest of man's single working power and the trickiest. As the intellect is the frailest, the most subjective to derangement, the most given to cowardice, betrayal, unless it is held steady and sane by the power of instinct. And this, this statement, held steady and sane, <laughs> reminds me of um, you know, the idea of sthita pradnya in uh, the Gita, that or or when we talked about um, you know staying on track and not getting off track, uh, I forget the name of the book, Shrikant. You have to remind me. It's uh, the the devil. Uh, uh, yes, uh, outwitting the devil. Oh yeah, yeah, outwitting the devil. That's right. And Napoleon Hill, I think. Um, so yeah, I think this. Um, you know, there are so many lessons to take from this essay and uh there you know, there are so many um so many seeds that he's sown in this essay that we can just take one and let it kind of um flourish in our minds so i think um taking sherry's idea of looking at the plates going forward and seeing you know what what else can we do with and what uh, inspires us from these plates? These are just really gorgeous plates to look at. I, I just want Thank to make you. one comment and then I want to talk about the next uh, steps. Um, you know, I'm going through the uh, first essay and look at all the groups that he has, you know, physical powers and look at in the, in the Montessori classroom, you know, physical powers, fully respected, fully respected. You're not sitting, sitting, in those chairs, it's saying physical powers don't matter. Okay, whereas this is full respect for physical powers. The intellectual group, okay, that is there uh, throughout. Um, emotional group, you know, you're letting the child choose. They're tired, they can do one thing. If they're energized, they can, their interest, you're, you're using their interest. The moral group, there is a lot of things in. Montessori, which are which are focused on the moral and the spiritual, which is the connection between between uh, people that he's uh, talking about, uh, which is also there. So it's it's very interesting to see the parallel. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Rupali, for bringing it up. Uh, so Sherry, how do you want to proceed with the with the uh, plates? What what do you want to do next? I'm I'm trying to unmute, and the cat keeps bumping my arm. <laughs> um. um what what do we have here that well we just have the last uh four or five plates there four or five plates uh, they're not there's not four or five it's one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven oh plates. wow okay, there's a lot of plates. yeah so after our interlude there's eleven plates um Okay, you, you know what? You don't have to decide. Uh, we don't have to decide now, but let's yeah. give it some thought. Uh, I don't think we should do something on the Thanksgiving weekend, obviously. No. So we'll take a break. And so we'll come back uh, the week after that. Uh, Jeannie, go ahead. Oops. Oops. Go ahead. Okay, so um, I wanted to show my homework. Please. Yes, please. So... Um... So I started with the same um, pentagon and mm -hmm. curve. And um, this time I wanted to be more um, into plants. And so I created this. So, um, you know, there's a lot of parallel axes in here, you can see with the leaves and um, the whole thing breaks a sort of symmetry. You can see that it's it's basically the pentagon and these larger leaves. Um, there's five, but it, when when it comes to these, there's only four. 
that's partly because this one is uh folded back and so um it uh you know kind of breaks the space but it still has a a lot of symmetry to it but it's not altogether symmetrical anymore but i wasn't very satisfied with this so um i want to get a little bit more organic so i went to this one and um here I, the way i managed to make it a little more organic is um that all of these lines here are now not all of them, but they're mostly continuous lines rather than little bits and pieces. And then I made the center part here. It actually is a spiral. I guess you probably can't see it, but mm -hmm. um, I made the parallel lines turn into a spiral in that. So, um, you know, that was my latest thing. And then I wanted to show you my polyhedra. So, um, whoops, let's see here. <clears throat> So um, it, it's the same polyhedra that I had before, but I'm going to show you this one first. Mm. This is the Shupi style. And again, it's an icosadodecahedron, which is halfway between a icosahedron, which is triangles, and a dodecahedron, which is um, pentagons. And you can see here uh, a pentagon. I think it's going to be easier than in the later one. One, two three, four, five, mm -hmm. and then the the triangles are actually six beads. So you can see both of those shapes in here. Now I wanted to put some protrudences on there. And um, I did this and I, I put them, unlike before I put them on the edges here, I put it on the, um, the Pentagon. So the Pentagon is now hidden and it's hidden by a group of four. So I cheated and because it was getting too crowded and I was afraid I was going to lose, you know, not make enough beads work out. And then, uh, so anyway, that was artist uh, in me. I, I took one of them out, but it still has a lot of symmetry in that way. And then I was thinking, how could this turn organic? And um, I mean, there's a little compartment in here, which is handy for something. And, um, and there's all these things that are on the outside. So, uh, you know, it makes it more difficult to eat, perhaps, you know, saves you from uh, certain things. And it, there's a sort of a protection that's created by those things sticking out. And uh, so then you can have something like, um, you know, the sea germ. <laughs> love that <laughs> wonderful thank you thank you so much all right all right all right folks uh so this is this is great Jeannie if it is okay can you I want to talk to you about about some things would you be able to stay on after this meetup for a few minutes okay wonderful go, go ahead um Sherry Rupali has something Rupali Oh, I just, Jimmy, I want to ask you, what is the uh, connecting material you're using between the beads? It looks like it's elastic. Oh, oh you're, you're on mute. mute. You're on mute. You're on... Jimmy, you're on mute. Uh, Jimmy, you need to unmute. Yeah, she's it's got it it's wire. It's a thin wire that's flexible. Ah. <gasps> All right. So uh, I just want to make sure. Give me a second. This, uh, Jeannie, this is this <laughs> is a dual of what you showed. This is, I think it is called tricotahedron or something. So yeah. do you know that when you convert each of these vertices into a polygon, it becomes the other one. So that's, this is like the brother of mm -hmm. that. Okay, just, just wanted to show. All right, folks. Also, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for a wonderful, a wonderful evening, uh, afternoon. <laughs> thank you. It's been really great having somebody so eager to do all the homework uh, because <laughs> it really adds, I think, to everybody's um, understanding of the book.
Yes, and absolutely. It's going to be very difficult for me to do the tracing. I'd, I have to figure out how to do tracing in, in 3D. Well, you have to oh. be careful when you trace, Srikant, that you don't put indents in your pages. Oh, no, no, no. I, I mean, I'm going to trace something like this. Oh, okay. I, I thought you were to... talking about your copy of the book to trace. You know, no, 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 no. I'm not going to touch the copy. <laughs> You can you can do it in a three D printer for a three D image. You can create a three D image and it will. Okay. If you're All interested, right. we'll talk later. All right, all right, folks. Uh, Jeannie, if you could stay on, would appreciate that. All right, see you, everybody. Bye. You. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye. Happy Thanksgiving. 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 All right, uh, Jeannie. So, um, Iris, I will see you next time. Hi, Iris. So, Jeannie, um, I'm really excited about uh, December 7th. Uh, so it's December 7th, right? Right. Okay. Um, what I want to do is I want to launch off the um, the book series um, right away. So I have two choices. I can either, I, what I want to do is I want to fold it into the old structure that uh, CJ had, which is once a month because that gives enough time for people to take in a chapter, think about it, and then come back. Each week is too sm uh, small a frequency. So I'm going to launch it off. Uh, I want to launch off um, you know, December 6th. So I want to do it every first Wednesday. So uh, every first Wednesday of the month. Um, and so, and it'll be put on both uh, Greater Philadelphia Thinking Society and 52 Living Ideas. So it was exactly like, you know, we did, uh, we did, uh, you know, how, how CJ did his meetups. We will just go through, I will come up with a chapter list and we will go chapter by chapter. We'll ask people to watch the video and then discuss it. Watch the video, discuss it. Okay. And I will go ahead. I'll continue working with the, with the book. And when it comes, I'll try to get it out as quickly as possible, but I don't want to wait. I just want to start start off. And I think December 6th would be the best way of launching it. Uh, so people who care about uh, CJ know that we are doing this, that it has already started. And I think that would be the best way of doing it. What do you think? I like that. Okay. Okay. So I will talk to, uh, go ahead. Well, what about the, the 7th? is the next day. Well, yeah. I was wondering, I mean, I've been using Jitsi, but <laughs> sometimes it fails. I was wondering if you'd want to use the Zoom. Uh, I can, I Zoom. Can, yeah, I can I can give you a Zoom link. Just give me a Zoom. Yeah, I will I'll will send you a Zoom link and I will host it. Uh, what time is it? Seven. Seven. Okay. I will go ahead. I will I will be uh, I'll send you a Zoom link that you can send to everybody. Okay. Um, give me give me a day or so, um, and I will send you the Zoom link, and you can use that. I think uh, it's far more easier for you know far it's easier. You know, people are used to Zoom. Yeah, I mean, every now and then it just totally messes up on Jitsi, and it's kind of embarrassing. And if that happened on the seventh, I would be a yes. <laughs> horrified. No, I will I will take care of the technical things, so you don't have to worry about the technical things. Okay, around. okay. And then what about um? A schedule of of what we talk about. I mean, I guess it would be maybe open to people sharing their ideas, and I I don't know. What do you think on on December seventh, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, um, that, that's that's a good thing. Uh, good question. Um, let me think. I mean, it shouldn't really be more than an hour. I think is good enough. And, okay. and, you know, make, make it kind of short. And then, I don't know, in a way, maybe some people just, you know, will get started talking and they just talk on and on. I don't know how to really handle that either, but. Yeah, I can, um, I can do that. I can, like, if you want, I can host it. That's fine. You know, I, I you can. You want to host it? If, okay. if you want, I, you know, if you want, whatever you want, uh, Jeannie, whatever you, you, you tell me what you want and I will be happy to do anything that you want me to do. Can you bring CJ back? I'm sorry. <laughs> that I'm not capable of doing. That I'm not capable of doing. No. Um, yes. Um, no, I'm 
kidding around. I know you can't do that. Mostly, um, mostly. That's uh, what I want most. <laughs> yes. Uh, it will be mostly family members. Yeah. Well, the thing is, um, I mean, again, we're having problems with accessing his computer, but if we can access it, I mean, he has a huge mailing list and maybe other people will want to come. I don't know. I, okay. I can't really say, but it would, you know, on the Zoom, you at least have the ability to have a lot of people if they want to do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, probably won't be so many people. True. So okay. let, let me give it some thought uh, about how, you know, um, what's the best way of, of doing it. Um, and le let's talk a little bit. Um, you know, uh, basically I'll be guided by you, but I can give you some suggestions. I know it's a very difficult thing to plan. Um, but uh, so l let me, let me do what, you know, let, let me gi give me up a day or so. Let me just think about it. All right. You know, I mean, you can do this so much better than I can. Yeah, I will. I'll take care of it. You know, I'm happy to take care of the whole thing. You know, and anything that you want me to do. Okay. Uh, as much or as little. Well, as okay. Then, then I have to make the offer. If there's anything you'd like me to do, please ask that Absolutely. I can do it. Absolutely. All right. Take care. See you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Shukran.